True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Blairsville, Pennsylvania, an hour's drive from Pittsburgh, a factory town which once turned out the steel and glass that helped build America. This is small town USA, where life is comfortable and safe. At least that's what everyone thought, until a spring day in 2006. On the afternoon of April 13th, a teenaged boy makes a shocking discovery at his next door neighbor's house. He was so upset. He's like, you have to come now, it's John. He's dead. When 39-year-old dentist John Yelenik is murdered, his neighbors become suspects. They turn to a pair of clairvoyant sisters who say the real killer works in law enforcement. I called uh, Suzanne and Jean and asked them if they would be interested in coming to Blairsville to do a reading over in John's house. Three months after the killing, they visit the crime scene. The first thing I'm kind of bringing in with John is there is this energy around Melissa right now that those two went to high school together and he's sending his love to her and letting her know that everything is going to be all right. He's also telling me that he's very sad for his son. Um, there's a lot of trauma must be going on for his son right now. And that he's telling me that this case will be solved. I'm kind of getting a vibe over here that they must have been back in here getting some more evidence because I'm getting like there's some new evidence coming in from um, uh, who does the evidence? The, um, the Attorney General? Attorney General's office. I see that there's going to be some more evidence coming in to, um, to this. Um, also, he's letting me know um, that, that there definitely is law enforcement involved in it, and, I, and he's showing me a reddish colored uh, man. It kind of looks like that actor. Uh, Michael Rappaport. He looks like that high forehead, like a reddish color hair, about uh, maybe like 5'11", paler complexion, smaller eyes. And also a female is involved in this. To what part the female is involved, I feel she's watching or waiting. I don't feel that she's actually had anything to do with the actual blood and, sh and, and knifing and, and stabbing. I don't feel she had anything to do with that. Um, I, I differ on that. I, I feel the female maybe had came in and went back out and like a, as a second pair of eyes or some help um, just to keep a watch so they can get the job done. Yeah, that's um, what I meant to say. Yeah, the watch. Yeah, that's what I mean. And um, I'm, I'm leaning towards it being solved, but uh, I think it's going to be a, a fight. A fight with a lot of um, professional attorneys and a lot of legal stuff and things being like poo pooed to the side and, and getting away with it and then um, having to re come back at it to uh, try to convict the person. I'm, I'm getting a little wave on, on an actual conviction for a long time. But uh, in, the, in the end, I'm going to probably go with um, jail time for the people who did do this. It may take a while, but I'm, I'm, they're going to do some jail time. The way the energy goes, this, this gentleman, John, it was just so loving and just peaceful. Mm -hmm. To be um, bludgeoned is, is the best way to put it. I mean, this is someone's brother. This is someone's father. This is someone's beloved best friend. You know, we look at this as like an angel influence that, you know, just out of nowhere came to us to help bring some resolution. And I'm hoping that when we do do this, whatever we gave to the gentlemen that were in that room, that the bits and pieces can lead someone to justice and, and do jail time. Also, John came in and told me that there won't be any fingerprints in his house. It's very hard for fingerprints, maybe like one or two. But he showed me that he got a scratch. He just said, you'll see just a little bit, like I got them, but there's no fingerprints, and they're really, really clean, or you might find like a half one. I still felt a female was over him asking him, is he dead yet? The female was more malicious and more cold-hearted and more negative, and she was actually watching him bleed out. Let's go, is he dead yet? Come on, let's go, let's get out of here, you know? Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. This episode is sponsored by Nutrafol. To get your first month's supply with subscription for $10, visit nutrafol.com slash tcb and use promo code tcb during checkout. The life of John Yelenik, a young, friendly, prominent dentist who was murdered in Pennsylvania back in 2006, was intertwined with the lives of his soon-to-be ex-wife Michelle and her live-in boyfriend, 
Pennsylvania State Trooper Kevin Foley. All three of these people had specific personalities and beliefs, which can be easily traced to their childhoods and their family relationships. In our discussion of the murder of Dr. John Yelenick, we will see how these three lives came together through seemingly random circumstances and culminated in a brutal homicide. Now, no one wins in murder, we know that. The violent loss of one life devastates many lives. To completely understand this murder case, we'll go back to where the story began. John was brought up by a mother to give generously and to ask for little in return. Even after he became financially successful, he remained a kind, humble man. Some would say that his marriage to Michelle was a mistake from the start. At the quiet end today, we'll take a look at John's childhood, Michelle's beginnings, and the background of her boyfriend, Kevin Foley. In The Trooper's Target, join us for the story of a ruthless murder with a psychological examination of the victim and his killer or killers. And Dick, as always, has brought us a local beer to go along with the story. A fine Pennsylvania beer called Sunday Morning Stout, which doesn't mean that you only drink it Sunday mornings, but could be an appropriate time. Okay. It's brewed by Weyerbacher Brewing Company in Easton, Pennsylvania. Before people jump on me, it is an imperial stout. So this guy is pitch black, no head. It's got a nice roasted malt character, some coffee and bourbon. And the taste is very similar. Espresso, bourbon, a little sweet chocolate thrown in there, and a hint of vanilla. Very nice. Now it's a 12.5% alcohol by volume, so it's a beer to be sipped. Absolutely. We won't chug it. No, we won't. Okay. We'll enjoy it. But let's open it up and then we'll head on down. Okay. Here we are. Pull up a stool. I got it. Except I'm going to stay out of the way of the dart throwers. Did you see they set up a dart board here? That's new, isn't it? It is new. I heard that the owner of the place wanted it to look more like a British pub, since there's so many new beer drinkers around here. Okay. But I'm not sure a dart board's the way to go. I don't know. I always enjoy dart throwing. I used to have a board in my basement as a child, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, you have to be careful. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my parents were pretty much... Raise kids wild. Let them do what they need to do to okay. learn the lessons in life. Just don't cross the dart path when they're throwing. <laughs> right, exactly. Right? Because that can hurt. And I hope they don't change the food too much. I mean, I'm not going to eat a steak and kidney pie. No, that's not something you would eat. No. No. Well, we'll see. I mean, we don't eat a lot here anyway, as long as they have the beers. But, you know, we're not huge into the British beers either. We aren't. No. So I'm not sure this is what he really means to do, but we'll see. We'll see. See how it goes. All right, how about we start our story? Okay. John Joseph Yelenick Jr. was born in 1967 in Blairsville, Pennsylvania, to Mary Lois and John Joseph Yelenick Sr. Now, when John Jr. was just three months old, his father was killed in an automobile accident. So Mary provided for herself and her infant son, and that was her mission in life. She returned to her job as an elementary school teacher, and she was able to pay their living expenses. John was babysat every day by his aunts and Emma, his nanny, until school was over and Mary came home. Mary kept John pretty busy. She was a very encouraging factor in his life. She just had such a big influence over him. She did. So she wanted to make sure he performed well academically, but also had a wide range of interests in terms of music, drama, and Boy Scouts. Mary, on her part, never remarried. Her focus was on John and giving him a stable home. She kept a short leash on John as a young boy, and as a single parent, she was a very protective parent. John had to fill a void growing up without a father, but he grew up kind and patient, a friend to most people he met. Mary kept a distance from some of her siblings. Mary and John Sr. weren't married when John was conceived, and the extended family didn't approve of that. She raised her only son in a very protective bubble, and even those who adored him had to admit he was a real mama's boy. Mary had been just 22 when she got pregnant, but she was a very serious and devoted parent. Probably the most significant male influence in John's life then was the local dentist, Dr. Riley. Mary regularly took John for appointments with Dr. Riley from the age of six. Young John was enthralled by the dental equipment. He really admired Dr. Riley and he ended up telling him he wanted to be a dentist one day. Most of his peers saw him as a real nerd. 
He was friendly and intelligent, but very inept socially. Dr. Riley formed a bond with John, though, and he helped to guide him through college, and eventually he did go to dental school. When John graduated from dental school in 1992, it was Dr. Riley who attended his graduation ceremony along with John's mom. Mary spent over 20 years as a teacher in Blairsville, living in the same house with her son, which she owned without a mortgage. She was very frugal, and she had an adequate income, aided by investments she made when she got insurance money from John Sr.'s death. Just before graduating from dental school, John asked Dr. Riley if he had room in his practice for another dentist. Now, Riley was pretty impressed with John. He was a competent dentist, and he seemed to have a, a way with his patients. So in 1994, Dr. Riley and John formed a partnership, and from then on, they worked together in a successful dental practice in Blairsville. It seemed as if John had found his place. He was popular, witty, fun, and confident. So it looks like college and dental school brought him out of his uh, shell a little bit. Well, that's kind of how it works. You're a nerd in high school. Then you become successful. Finally, you're the cool guy because you've got the money and the successful business, right? right? Yeah. That must have happened to you. <laughs> or were you cool from the beginning? I was always cool. Okay. No. <laughs> far, far from it. Yeah. I was the proverbial nerd. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess once you finish up and start working, and if, if you can manage your work pretty well, my case, running a practice, you certainly will get some confidence doing that. Absolutely, you will. So. Yeah. So when Mary was diagnosed with terminal cancer at the age of 52, John was already dating Michelle Magyar Kamler. Now, the details of exactly how John met Michelle vary. The basic story is that sometime in either late 1996 or early 1997, John was introduced to Michelle by friends and quickly became smitten. Although John had dated several other women, none affected him like Michelle. John thought he was the luckiest man in the world by being with Michelle. Dr. Riley would say that John had met Michelle at some sort of promotional event for a beer company. He remembered her as a Coors Light or Budweiser girl. And I didn't think that that was a very complimentary thing when he said it. I don't think it I was. I think he said it in a way like that wasn't very great. Well, he didn't like her. No, most people didn't. John's friends and family were never really sure where or when the two met, and Dr. Riley remembered that John had asked one of his patients if he knew any single girls. Michelle was 25, the mother of two children, a daughter, Nicole, seven, and a son, Nathan, who was four. So she probably seemed to come with a ready-made family to John Yelenek. She was a beautiful woman who seemed really desperate for stability. And as John told one of his cousins later, I've won the homecoming queen. At first, John's friends and relatives were really happy for him. If he was happy, then they were happy. If anyone suspected that Michelle was a real manipulator, they kept that to themselves. John gave Michelle a car, he bought her jewelry, and he gave her other expensive gifts. I mean, he was super taken with her. So let's talk a little bit about who she was. Sure. Michelle was born in 1971 to Betty and John Magyar Sr. in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Her parents divorced when she was two. Her father moved out and left Betty to raise Michelle and her brother and sister on her own. John Magyar Jr., Michelle's brother, became the man of the house at a pretty early age. And the father, for his part, went on with his life, remarried and fathered another child. So insecurity was significant in Michelle's early childhood development. Her mother Betty's personality was passive, and certainly was no match for Michelle's aggressiveness, which grew when her mother gave in to Michelle's demands. And there, with no father figure and a passive mother, Michelle certainly lacked the discipline and confidence needed to develop into a well-adjusted person. All little girls are in love with their fathers, at least at some point. To them, their fathers are bigger than life and give them unconditional love. If the remaining parent the mother is not emotionally strong. The result can be an impulsive, self-centered, and very immature young woman. And I think that's a pretty good description of Michelle. It does sound like her. So Betty gave in to Michelle's temper tantrums and demands. Michelle often screamed and broke things without being disciplined or corrected. Respect, which normally binds a child to her parent, was missing. Betty loved her daughter, but by the time Michelle was a teen, Betty had no control over her. No, she didn't. By the 10th grade, Michelle was done with the vocational classes and high school. 
so at 16 she dropped out. A few months later, in 1986, she married her high school sweetheart, Jeff Kamler. By 1990, they had two children, and the marriage was done. By March of 1997, John Yelenick was with Michelle, and he was so taken with her that he financed a business for her in Blairsville. This was a sandwich shop in a small storefront building, only a few feet from the intersection that was at the heart of downtown Blairsville. Michelle, her two kids, and her mom moved into an apartment over the shop. Between March and May that year, John put in over $15,000 for the sandwich business. And at first, Michelle was keeping very good records. Her meticulous record keeping showed that she was organized and efficient when she wanted to be. The records showed the place was actually making a monthly profit. The idea was actually a good one. A sandwich shop at that location was definitely going to make some money. But Michelle quickly tired of it and closed up the shop just two months after opening it. Yeah, it was kind of vague on why it closed. Was it just that she didn't want to do it? Well, from the things I read from her brother and some of the people from the Yelenik family, that seems to be the belief. But I don't know the details. I just know that the books were very meticulous in the beginning. And then she just kind of seemed to lose interest. Yeah, she certainly did. But there was the coinciding illness of the mother-in-law. It wasn't her mother-in-law yet, but of John's mom. Not yet mother-in-law. Right. So pretty quickly after they closed up the sandwich shop, uh, they learned that John's mother, Mary, was dying of terminal cancer. So Michelle moved into the Yellenek home as a part-time caregiver for Mary. A few weeks later, in June of 1997, Mary died, which obviously devastated her only son, John. Interestingly, a month after Mary's death, John named Michelle as his sole heir in case of his death, gave all rights in his estate, which which would include the assets of his mother's estate, to Michelle. Now, that's a kind of a weird thing to do. Sounds like an overreaction or something. They're not even married yet. I know, and at the time, few of John's relatives or friends were even aware that he'd made that decision. But it was witnessed by his lawyer, so there's never any doubt that it was a valid thing. But why did he? I mean, only a month after his mom died, why did he agree to make his girlfriend of less than a year his heir? I mean, I could see that he was probably feeling very lonely after his mom died. Yeah, all all his life, mom had been his support. Now she's gone. But now he had another woman who seemed to be as strong and as dominating as Mary had been. So maybe that's it. He thought he'd found, maybe not a substitute for his mother, but someone who could remind him of her. And just kind of take over that role as the dominating person. Yep. Because he wasn't. So within a few months of Mary's death and the will being changed or or will being written, John sold the Blairsville house that he'd grown up in. And by the end of the year, he and Michelle got married in Las Vegas. This was on New Year's Eve, 1997. This quick marriage of John and Michelle left some people in Blairsville very surprised. Dr. Riley had tried to get John to slow things down. He'd said, John, what's the hurry? John answered, I don't want to be alone at Christmas. Well, no, and I can see that. He wanted a family. He was insistent that Michelle was the love of his life, too. To John, Michelle was a prize. She was very pretty, and she was visible evidence that the high school nerd got the pretty girl. John bought a house in Blairsville and settled in with Michelle and the two kids. And he seemed to have everything he wanted, right? He's got his career, a loving, beautiful wife, two children, a home in a nice neighborhood. He's going to raise his own family. It's really all he wanted in life. Michelle and John began trying to get pregnant right away, too. But whether Michelle's earlier tubal ligation and the attempted reversal interfered with conception, or if there was some other kind of problem, it didn't work out. John and Michelle spent thousands attempting in vitro fertilization, And it didn't work. So that took an emotional toll on the marriage. It tends to do that. Certainly would. Dr. Riley and others noticed that Michelle was seeming kind of distant, disinterested in John's longtime friends and associates in the hometown. She didn't seem to like Blairsville. Blairsville seemed too small for Michelle. In a place where everyone knew everyone else and knew a lot about each other's lives, that may have made her uncomfortable because people were curious about her. They wanted to know what the story was about the biological father of her kids. And Michelle began to think that people were talking about her and that she would never be accepted in Blairsville. Well, you know, small towns, they like to talk about people. 
Right. And she wasn't really the small town person. Well, she certainly didn't want people talking about her. No. So Michelle is a pretty controlling person, particularly of John. She would often criticize him in front of other people, even in front of his employees in the dental office. And John took this all silently, as if he was afraid to upset her. So it sounds like Michelle's mother. Same same approach. Exactly. John had done whatever his mother wanted him to do, and now John did everything Michelle wanted him to do. The only difference may have been that John's mother had John's best interests in mind. And we're not so sure about Michelle. So that's a big difference. It's yes. one thing to have a domineering person in your life who's looking out for you. It's a whole other thing to have someone who's only looking out for themselves. True that, <laughs> as we say. So in early 2000, John and Michelle decided to adopt a child. Michelle went on the internet and soon learned about babies available for adoption in Russia or the Ukraine. So in March of 2000, John, Michelle, her two children, and her mother all went to Russia. John paid for the whole trip. There, John and Michelle adopted Jamie, who was a boy born in June of 1998. In the months after Jamie's adoption, both John and Michelle seemed to be pretty content. Michelle convinced John to move the family from Blairsville to Indiana, Pennsylvania. By comparison with Blairsville, Indiana was the big city. Had a lot more people, a university, more restaurants and bars, and more of a social scene. So the couple bought a house in the upscale residential area of North Indiana on White Farm Road, which was about a mile north of downtown, and the famous Jimmy Stewart Museum. Well, right, and Indiana's claim to fame was Jimmy Stewart grew up there, right? Right, and, and some even say that it was the model for Benson. Was it Benson in A Wonderful Life? Whatever the name of the town was. It wasn't Benson. Benton? Where they, where they moved was the model for that. I thought it was something falls anyway. Benson Falls. Was it? Benton Falls. Oh, Jesus, I don't know. All right, we butchered that anyway. Yeah. Whatever. we got to look up our wonderful life. But story. that was their claim to fame. It was, you know, it's a wonderful life. They'd say at everything in Indiana, right? The signs. That was their thing. Right. So the house they bought was a two-story colonial on a large lot with a swimming pool. And John had to commute, so he commuted from Indiana to his practice in Blairsville. That was about a half hour each way, so not terrible. But the move from Blairsville to Indiana really estranged John from his friends in his hometown, and he became more reserved, maybe a little bit sad. After a while, there was infidelity on both sides in the marriage. So by all accounts, by as early as late 2001, the marriage was in big trouble. John had grown really close to Michelle's son Nathan, who was a little over 10 at that time. Nathan played in a youth ice hockey league, and John often went to his practices and his games. There, John met the mother, a divorcee, of another player, and they began a relationship. It may have been an innocent relationship, but Michelle became really jealous. According to John, Michelle began following the other woman and sending her threatening letters. John might have given Michelle some valid reasons to be jealous of this woman, but the threatening letters did seem a bit over the top, even for a jealous wife. Michelle's interactions with the woman actually caused the woman to stop talking to John and break off the relationship, which may have just been a friendship. We don't know. We don't. Could have been an affair, though. But the implication is that there was some sex involved. Yeah, nobody's saying that John was a saint by any means. Right. Right. Anyway, by February of 2002, the Yellenic marriage was on the rocks. John moved out of the White Farm Roadhouse and back to the house in Blairsville. Michelle was soon seen around town with a wealthy Indiana businessman. The area state senator, who was a friend of John's cousin, Mary Ann Clark, recalled meeting Michelle at a party in early 2002. His first thought was that Michelle was a professional escort. As he remembered, Michelle was dressed very provocatively. Now, Michelle dated a married executive in Indiana who broke up with her to return to his wife. Within a short time, he complained about Michelle to the state police. Yeah, there was some kind of um, computer harassment she was doing, online harassment. Yeah. Yeah, and he did complain to the police about it. Right, and actually state police investigators came to see Michelle at her White Farm Road house. Yeah, reportedly one of those investigators at the house that day was Kevin Foley. 
Nothing came of that complaint. The investigation had found no violation of any laws and no criminal case was filed against her. But it is significant for that may be the first time she met him. So that seemed to lead nowhere. But then the two really matched in some ways because Foley was a man who loved to do good, especially for women that he believed had been abused by men. So you could see Michelle was a woman who put herself first and had some complaints about the way she was treated by men. And Kevin, who was 37, was this big guy, about six foot three, 225 pounds, very muscular, who worked out a lot, and may have been on steroids, we can't say for sure. But he did have a very muscled build. And even without any chemical enhancements, he was quite gifted as an athlete. He regularly ran 15 to 20 miles a week, and he played football, softball, basketball, and ice hockey. So tell me a little bit about Kevin. Kevin James Foley. He was born in 1965 in Hempstead, New York. He and his twin sister Karen were adopted by Gail and Kenneth Foley. They were familiar with the adoption process since they had already adopted a boy they named James when he was very young. By 1967, Gail was ready to expand her family and give James siblings. So this set of twins, who were Kevin and Karen, were born to a young couple who could not provide a secure home for the infants. When Gail became aware of the twins, it was explained to her that the young children were living in a home with little food, dirty clothing, and parents who were very young and unable to even take care of themselves. So the twins were adopted by the Foley's. I'm assuming that was legal. Yes. They didn't just snatch them. No, it was totally legal. Because it, it sounds a little bit like people are taking advantage of this young couple. Well, I don't know, because with the Department of Human Services, it was a very neglectful situation, and they lost custody of the kids. Oh, okay. I haven't seen anything about them fighting to get it back either. True. So after these twins were adopted, the Foley family moved to the upstate New York Lake Resort community of Massapequa. Physically, the twins adapted to their new mother, father, and brother. With Gail's loving parenting, she tried to repair the damage that the twins had been exposed to in their first two years of life. But we all know that just being taken from your parents is traumatic, no matter how young you are. It's an adjustment. It is, and these kids were two years old. Yeah, so that could be difficult. But as far as we know, they were raised well by the Foley's. It seems like it, yes. Yes. And Kevin was a real born jock. After he became a policeman, he was designated the Indiana Barracks Official Physical Fitness Coordinator. That was in 2001. But Kevin had some psychological eccentricities. Very self-righteous. He was very quick to judge others. You know, people could never do things right in his mind. In his mind, he was the man on the white horse, the knight in shining armor, if you will dedicated to the rescue of damsels in distress. He was too streetwise to make that claim out loud to his colleagues, because of course they'd make fun of him. But he did see himself as a kind of a hero. And he knew what bad was. He'd been there, seen that, and even experienced it personally, even though he was very young at the time. What a lot of people who later talked about Kevin didn't understand and probably never knew, even his closest friends in the Pennsylvania State Police, was that he had this mentality this desire to right wrongs, and this was probably one of the most dominating aspects of his entire personality. This was him. This was him. Yeah. Now, Kevin and his sister Karen had allegedly been physically abused as children before they were adopted by the Foley's. So Kevin's reaction to his early childhood may have been a key factor in who he became as an adult. After his rough start, Kevin grew up in what would seem to have been an ideal environment. Whether this upbringing with two extremes formed Kevin's fundamental black and white outlook on life is uncertain, but it provided him with distinct parameters for his rigid sense of moral judgment, because there wasn't any gray in Kevin. No, I don't think so. He really seemed to see things in black and white, which can be dangerous and troublesome. Well, yeah. Yeah. Nothing's all black or all white. No, it's really right? hard to live that way and be reasonable. So by the time he was in his teens... Kevin was sure that he knew what was right and what was wrong, as well as who was good and who was evil. Now, he'd had a pretty normal life with his two adoptive parents. When he was 12 years old, the family moved to Florida, and from the late 70s, the family lived on Florida's Gulf Coast. 
Kevin joined the Army, taking training as a military policeman, then he served in Germany in the mid-1980s. Even back then, he was a physically intimidating guy. After his discharge from the Army, Kevin enrolled in community college, and he obtained an associate's degree in criminal justice. So from 1990 to 1992, he attended the final two years of a four-year criminal justice program at South Florida University. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in criminology in 1992, which was the same year John Yelenek graduated from dental school. By then, Kevin had met his first wife, Barbara Ann Ray, while she was a pharmacist at a nearby Walmart store. Barbara was from Pennsylvania, just west of Indiana. So after graduation, Kevin and Barbara headed to her home state, and after passing an exam to qualify as a municipal police officer, Kevin was hired by the town of Freeport in 1993. A few months later, Kevin was accepted into the Pennsylvania State Police Training Academy that was for the class of 1994. He was assigned to the Pennsylvania State Police Barracks in Indiana as a trooper. Kevin and Barbara were together until 1999 when Kevin sued her for divorce, and they never had any children together. Over a year later, in early 2000, Kevin was transferred to the State Police Criminal Investigations Division as a plainclothes detective. So this was a big promotion, and he was assigned to the Indiana Barracks. In September 2002, Kevin married again. He married Susan Marie Smith, a bank employee in Indiana, and she was a year older than he was. But this marriage failed a lot faster than the first one did. So whether Kevin's 2002 marriage to Susan was doomed from the start by his meeting with Michelle in connection with the computer hacking case, that's uncertain. But both Kevin and Michelle each filed for divorce from their spouses in the same month, June of 2003, actually just 13 days apart. So take what you will from that. To me, I think there's a correlation. There probably was. Probably was. So Kevin would say later that he didn't begin dating Michelle until the summer of 2004. But Susan Smith had never publicly commented on her marriage to Kevin, so she's never said why it ended. Whatever the truth is about the timing of Kevin's first romantic encounter with Michelle, by early 2002, we know that Michelle already had some other legal troubles. Her first husband, Jeff Kamler, was suing her for joint custody of their daughter, Nicole, who was then 13 years old. Why Jeff Kamler was doing this so many years after he had divorced Michelle, or why his legal petition didn't include his son, Nathan, really wasn't clear from the court records. Kind of an odd thing, wasn't it? Yeah, one kid and not the other. Mm-hmm. That would bring about some suspicions. But it Michelle, would. Yeah. But Michelle did fight back. She hired a lawyer. Why the joint custody proceedings were filed after so many years was a mystery. But some said it was possible that John Yelenick might have financed this for Michelle's first husband. And he might have done that in an effort to win her back, because he was still in love with her and wanted her back. The custody case dragged on until 2003, and eventually it was settled. And after mediation ordered by the court, Michelle kept primary custody of Nicole. Then in June 2003, Michelle filed for divorce from John. She demanded sole custody of their adopted child, Jamie. Now, this was pretty much a declaration of war for John. In her petition for divorce from him, Michelle claimed that the marriage was irretrievably broken and that she, as John's wife, had suffered such indignities as to render her condition intolerable and life burdensome. That's quite a statement. Isn't it? I'll bet she didn't write that herself. (laughs) Sounds like something a lawyer wrote. Michelle claimed her residence was still at the house on White Farm Road in Indiana, and she wanted the divorce court to award her occupancy of the house, alimony, and child support. John would later dispute that Michelle was still living with the children on White Farm Road, She had actually left the house to move in with a new boyfriend, a wealthy heir in Johnstown. It would take another year of negotiations, but in June 2004, John sold the White Farm Road house at a significant loss. When he did finally sell a place, it was a wreck. Michelle had left the doors and windows open. There were animals living in it. So this White Farm Road property disaster wasn't John's only big financial loss in the divorce. 
between the time Michelle sued him for divorce in June 2003 and early 2006, John had agreed to cede 60% of the couple's joint real estate holdings, although all the assets had been accumulated from either John's inheritance from his mother or his own income from the dental practice. I don't know which, if that matters if you're married, right? It's all shared. Yeah, well, at least 50%. I don't know. I kind of feel like he agreed to do that because he wanted her back in the back of his mind all along. What do you think? I you think, think so? so? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Because he kept doing these idiotic things to try to win her back. I think so. It wasn't even smart stuff. But, yeah. you know, she probably led him on, too. Sure. Made him think, if you do this, I'll come back to you. She's a smart woman. She was very smart. Or shrewd. That's a good way to put it. So this whole issue of the Yellenic property, land, money, and life insurance, would turn out to be extremely important as a possible motive for John's murder in April 2006. Well, yeah, the investment properties were both worth a million dollars or more. Yeah. Yeah. An insurance of close to two million. Right. It's a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of people thought the killing of him was all about money. And others thought it was actually about revenge. Yeah, I'm, I think that Michelle was after the money, but I feel like Kevin, it was all about anger and revenge and saving the girl, you know? You want both, don't you? I think so. Trying to juggle his estranged wife's demands, maintaining some form of family normality and security for Jamie, Nicole, and Nathan, and increasing the number of patients seen in his dental practice, that was all taking a real toll on John, physically and mentally. He gained weight from taking antidepressants. He was drinking a lot and eating crappy food, just not taking care of himself. In late September of 2003, he had one of his scheduled visits with Jamie, who was now five years old. This visit of September 20th to the 21st took place at John's house in Blairsville, according to Michelle. She claimed that when Jamie returned, he told her that John had hit him in the mouth with his fist which resulted in cuts on both his upper and lower lip, as an emergency room doctor noted almost four days later. But there were reasons to doubt this account of abuse. On September 25, 2003, when the doctor first examined Jamie, at Michelle's request, he referred the boy for further investigation by the county's Children and Youth Services Department, or CYS. A social worker then talked to Michelle and Jamie about it. So based on the reports from these two interviews, a little over two weeks later, Michelle's lawyer obtained a Cambria County judge's order barring John from having any contact with either Jamie or Michelle as a protection from abuse order. Analysis of these reports and the subsequent legal filings raises the possibility that the whole thing might have been made up by Michelle in order to leverage a bigger financial settlement from John. So if that's the case, she is super manipulative. So the emergency room doctor who examined Jamie on September 25th, which was four days after the visit with John, mm -hmm. uh, his report read that Jamie said that his father punched him and choked him after he vomited. Jamie also states that his father swore at him. Now Callahan noted that Jamie had a swollen upper lip, but went on to report that there was no visible evidence of any choking signs around Jamie's neck, although he did seem to have a sore throat. And he apparently had a swollen lymph node in his neck. Which wouldn't come from abuse. Right. Right. Infection. So Callahan, the, the emergency room doctor, referred Jamie and Michelle to another physician named Regina T. Kupchella. Dr. Kupchella saw Jamie for the first and apparently only time five days after Callahan. Patient is a pleasant child and no apparent distress, Dr. Kupchella wrote in her report. Under an entry headed chief complaint, Kupchella noted that Jamie had, had been referred for further examination by the Cambria County CYS. Child allegedly hit in face by father. Possible previous episodes of inappropriate physical contact. Now, other than the sore throat and the slightly enlarged lymph node, and maybe an early ear infection, Kupchella could discern no injury at all to Jamie. So there were no lip cuts. Would those have normally been gone in the five days? Well, by the time she saw him, it was ten days. Oh, right, you're right. Then examination of Jamie's private parts showed no sign of any abnormalities, as Kupchella put in her follow-up report. 
On paper, there's nothing wrong with Jamie other than his slightly sore throat, which is not an unusual thing in kids at age five. As a result of Michelle's complaint about her estranged husband's supposed smacking of their adopted child, a social worker began a log of the investigation of the complaint of Michelle against John with regard to Jamie. Paper record would persist after the alleged event and cause trouble over the next few years because of what it seemed to say about John Yelenick. In the social worker's log, which was begun on September 25th, four days after the complaint of visitation, a social worker identified as TAC noted, the mother had the child examined due to him reporting to her that he had cuts on both his upper and lower lips, and his front tooth was loose from being hit by his father, John Yelenick. The father also allegedly picked the child up by his throat and choked him to the point that the child vomited. The phrasing of TAC's log suggests that TAC might have had some doubt as to the veracity of the claims of abuse. Why do you say that? Well, TAC noted there were no other obvious signs of injury, that the claim of abuse was through the mother and not initially from the child. Yeah, I think that's important. And it seems from this record that TAC had doubts about the truthfulness of the claim. Hmm. Well, I could see that. It's a tough spot to be in, especially in these divorces, you know. You hear one side or the other. Right. Barred by a court order from having contact with Jamie from October of 2003 to April of 2004, John soon sank into a really deep depression. It wasn't bad enough that Michelle had left John for other men, but being banned from contact with his adopted child, his only son, and on grounds of supposed violent abuse, that's devastating. John didn't understand how Michelle could even say that he was abusive, and it was especially upsetting to know that she was telling Jamie, the five-year-old, that his father had hurt him. Michelle was with Jamie night and day, so she had complete control over him, and I think any five-year-old is going to say what his mother tells him to say, if he's always with her. Well, she's the primary caretaker. Absolutely. And, and if she's saying things to him, sure. That's right. He just has that one side. What mm -hmm. else is he going to do? But worse things were still to come. By April of 2004, Michelle got a new house back in Indiana. About three weeks after that, under the pending 60-40 divorce property settlement, John and Michelle sold a valuable apartment building in downtown Indiana. Kevin Foley owned his own house in Indiana. He had retained the house in his divorce from Susan Smith. By this time, Kevin had been in plain clothes as a PSP investigator assigned to the Indiana barracks, for almost four years. One thing that most people remembered about Kevin from then was his difficulty in transitioning from being a uniformed trooper to being a detective. Because Kevin tended to rely on his physical, intimidating presence, when as an investigator, you really need to have some more subtle ways to get the job done. What many remembered vividly was Kevin's weird attachment to his four-inch pocket knife. Many over-the-road troopers carried similar knives. I mean, they could be useful in an emergency, right? Right. If a motorist is trapped by his seatbelt in an accident, something like that, you need to have a sharp knife handy. It can be useful. But Kevin, he seemed to have a number of them, and they were all these flick-out blades. He often practiced his knife flicking. It almost seemed like a nervous habit with him, the way some people might chew gum or chew their nails. He always played with his knife, flicking it and playing with it endlessly. He really seemed to enjoy showing it off as well. Yeah, one time he accidentally sliced the groin area of the pants of another trooper. Needless to say, the trooper wasn't very amused with this. And Kevin, for his part, was both embarrassed and apologetic. But, but that still, didn't, didn't stop him from playing with it. And that's kind of crazy. How did that even happen? I know. I mean, the guy must have been standing right next to him. I guess, but why are you flicking a knife like that? It's it's pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah. But he was still incessantly doing that, snapping it open and closed and flicking it around. It's really weird. John Yelenick's response to Michelle's divorce suit in the summer of 2004 included one demand that really pissed off Michelle, and that was that he wanted custody of Jamie. So the fate of Jamie became the largest issue between John and Michelle, and it began to occupy John's thoughts completely. Getting custody of Jamie became his goal in life. The more he tried to achieve it, the more Michelle resisted. The clock on the order of protection, which kept John from seeing Jamie, did run out in April of 2004. So visits between Jamie and John began again at that point. By the end of 2003, Kevin had moved into Michelle's house. 
Now Michelle had her own private bodyguard and a built-in babysitter. Jamie was told to call him Daddy, and Nicole and Nathan were told to call him Trooper. John and Jamie's visits went along uninterrupted for a whole year. Jamie seemed to be happy to spend every other weekend at John's house in Blairsville, where John was good about organizing get-togethers with other children from the neighborhood to help keep him entertained. At least in the beginning, Kevin tried to avoid being drawn into this war between his girlfriend and her estranged husband. But these stories of John's alleged abuse of Jamie made him really hate John. Kevin hated anyone who abused women or children. That was his whole thing. So almost from the beginning of Kevin's relationship with Michelle, it seems like he was ready to believe the very worst about John. So let's take a pause here and talk about our sponsors. Absolutely. Go for it. Nutrafol is a new, safe, and effective strategy to take control of your hair health. It's 100% drug-free, and it's clinically shown to improve thinning hair. It's also recommended by over 850 physicians in some of the top hair salons in the country. Since there's a formula for women and a formula for men, Dick and I both agreed that we would give it a try. Nutrafol's formula for women is specifically developed with women's lifestyles and life cycles in mind. Unlike men, whose primary hair health concern is genetics, for women, stress really plays a huge role in hair thinning. The daily demands of work and home life balance create elevated stress hormones in our bodies that are not our hair follicles' best friends. And for men, it's genetics, in addition to stress, diet, and environmental toxins that have all been shown to compromise hair health. Whatever the causes, you may be catching a reflection in the mirror, and you're concerned. <laughs> Maybe you're interested in something that's 100% drug-free. Nutrafol's botanical ingredients are shown to improve hair without compromising sexual health. Well, thank God. I guess. In fact, one of Nutrafol's key ingredients, saw palmetto, has been shown to support a healthier libido. What a great unexpected benefit. Awesome. Well, whatever your hair means to you, it's probably worth fighting for. It's been decades since anyone's made any meaningful advancements in the hair health industry. Nutrafol is not a magic pill, it's just a great strategy to grow hair from within by nourishing the environment where your hair grows from. Like a plant, you can feed it, water it, but if the soil isn't healthy, it can't thrive. Nutrafol is manufactured in the U.S. in an FDA certified facility and it contains no GMO, soy, eggs, dairy, or gluten. To try Nutrafol and get your first month's supply with subscription for $10, just go to Nutrafol.com forward slash TCB. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com forward slash TCB and use the promo code TCB. On the ordering page, you're going to see two boxes, so make sure you choose the one month supply box so you can get this deal. Sun Basket is also sponsoring this episode. Sunbasket delivers delicious meal kits right to your door, making healthy cooking easy and convenient for busy people. Absolutely. You know there are 18 healthy options to choose from each week, and they include paleo, gluten-free, lean and clean, and vegan. There's also the classic or the family box, and the family box is very kid-friendly for those of you with picky eaters at home. Because they work with only the best farms and suppliers and bring you fresh and organic produce, each recipe features clean, delicious ingredients. Your sun basket meal will taste like dinner out at a fancy restaurant, even if you aren't an experienced cook. Cooking with sun basket is quick and easy with delivery to your door and 30 minute recipes. No grocery shopping is required. Now, for dinner last night, Dick made sun baskets red lentil and chickpea dal with butternut squash and pita while I put the finishing touches on this week's crime research. It was faster than the usual dinners that he cooks from scratch, and he was done in time to watch The Handmaid's Tale with me. Maybe that was a drawback for him, but it made me happy to have him by my side. Now, I'm not a cook, but I plan on making tomorrow's Sun Basket recipe, and I'm not at all intimidated. With Sun Basket, there is no commitment either. You can take a break or cancel any time. So if you'd like to give it a try, go to sunbasket.com forward slash brewery today to learn more and get $35 off your first order. That's sunbasket.com forward slash brewery for $35 off. sunbasket.com forward slash brewery. 
Now, back to our story. Kevin was obviously in love with Michelle. She fit his emotional needs perfectly. Michelle was a beautiful woman in distress, the mother of three dependent children cast aside by a wealthy dentist. Kevin, who had been adopted decades before, could not help but sympathize with Nicole, Nathan, and Jamie. It's likely that in Kevin's mind, as Michelle's protector, he was the man she and her children needed. Now he really could be the white knight. Right. And I think that's exactly how he was looking at it. Really seems like it. It's very fitting. John became really unhappy after he was hearing from his six-year-old son, when mommy marries Trooper, you won't be my daddy anymore. Jamie talked so often about Trooper that John began to believe that Michelle was poisoning his mind against him. Then, in early April of 2005, Michelle claimed that on Jamie's visitations with John, John had sexually molested him. Wow, that's a serious claim. That is. The first suggestion of this claim actually came in March of 2005, when Kevin asked a fellow trooper a question. He asked, was there any way to tell if a child was really being sexually abused, or if the claim was made up? And that trooper, who was actually the Pennsylvania State Police Indiana Barracks expert on child molestation, told Kevin that it was hard to tell. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, she said. Kevin said that Jamie was making some strange remarks about his father to Michelle, but Kevin's only knowledge of this supposed abuse was coming through Michelle. Right. He hadn't heard it directly from the child. Jamie's not saying anything to him anyway. Right, only supposedly to Michelle. So this conversation between Kevin and Trooper Dina Kirkland took place on March 28, 2005, which was a day after Jamie had returned from a scheduled visit with John. Part of the visit by Jamie with his father was recorded on videotape by John. It was an Easter Sunday party, hosted by John for his son and neighborhood children on the 27th. It appeared on the video that Jamie was having no problems with his father. None of the behavior that you might expect from a child being sexually molested by a parent. There didn't appear to be any fear, avoidance, or stress. Jamie actually seemed to be having a great time. Of course, this wasn't evidence of John's innocence, but it did seem to contradict assertions by Michelle that Jamie had told her that he had been molested by John for more than a year. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the video proves anything. It doesn't. No. Does it? Not really. I mean, I guess you can kind of tell that a kid might look unhappy sometimes, but it doesn't tell you either way no, it whether doesn't. it's happening or not. No. I mean, I think that's all circumstantial stuff. Sure. But on April 13th of 2005, Michelle filed a formal complaint with the Pennsylvania State Police, alleging that John had sexually molested their son Jamie on April 9th. On the following day, Trooper Kirkland opened a formal investigation. Michelle complained that John had routinely molested Jamie while having him in his custody over the previous year. The public policy was that it's always better to protect the child than the rights of the accused, so John was no longer allowed to be alone with his son. And it's understandable. It sure is. You have to do that. But if she's making that up, that's an evil thing to do to the child and to John. It is. Trooper Kirkland later said she found John was very cooperative in answering her questions, but also arrogant in his demeanor toward her. The appropriate demeanor of a parent when being interviewed about sexual molestation charges made by one's estranged spouse is really difficult for me to determine. Experts say there's usually some outrage, denial, embarrassment, of course, compassion for the child, as well as a desire to protect him or her from the consequences of being used by a possibly vengeful, estranged spouse. When innocent, anger towards the estranged spouse for using the child in this horrible way is absolutely normal. But besides these feelings, John would have had another thought. Kirkland was a co-worker of Kevin, so perhaps a co-conspirator in the effort to take away his money and his relationship with his son. So that might have been why he was acting arrogant. He might have felt very defensive with her. Sure. She works with the guy that's living with his ex-wife. You got it. Yeah. So this is a, a big issue in here is the that Kevin worked for the police and the police are investigating all these different things. And John's feeling like, how can I get any kind of fairness here? Good question, isn't it? Which even becomes an issue after his death, right? A bigger issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Was there anything he could say that might convince Kirkland that he was innocent? 
In John's mind, this seemed pretty unlikely. In his view, she was Kevin's friend, helping in his destruction. But Kirkland knew what she was doing in her job. Five days later, on April 20, 2005, she interviewed Jamie. Now, it isn't clear from the available records whether Michelle was present at this conversation. Ordinarily, such an interview should be done privately between the investigator and the child. At the same time, a children and youth services investigation is open, and a social worker investigates independently of Kirkland. The allegation was investigated for almost two weeks after a judge issued a temporary order barring John from contact with Jamie until a May 19, 2005 hearing. After this hearing, the order was extended for six months, while Kirkland and the CYS each continued investigations. So you can see the damage this would do to make these false allegations. Besides messing up the kid to have him say these things, he's not going to see his father for months and months, which is a long time when you're that young. It is. He'll forget who he is in a way. The relationship will definitely falter. But from that point forward, Kevin was really going out of his way to scare John away from Michelle and Jamie. Even to the point of accosting him at his office, his house, in the courtroom, at Jamie's school, and even following him around town. Meanwhile, Kevin kept complaining about John, even wishing he was dead and suggesting to one co-worker that they should plot together to kill John. By September of 2005, Kirkland concluded her investigation, finding the molestation allegations were without merit. Kirkland might not have liked John Yelenick, and she did like Kevin, but she had to go with her best judgment so I give her credit for being professional. John had passed a polygraph test, so it seemed that there had been no molestation, and soon the CYS came to the same conclusion. But the court order banning John from contact with either Jamie or Michelle actually continued throughout the summer of 2005 as Kirkland and CYS investigations proceeded to the end. John adhered to the order. By the end of the summer, He no longer seemed angry over the allegations. He'd accepted what had happened, but he was very depressed and overwhelmed by it. He didn't want to talk too much about it with friends or family members, which I think is totally understandable. But despite everything, Michelle often called John at the dental office, asking him for more money. And he would always take her calls, and almost always gave in and gave her what she wanted. John also made no effort to contest the protection order, and he gave more money to Michelle while spending the summer alone in his house in Blairsville and never seeing his child. So I don't know if he just did this because he's so passive or if he still had a thought in his mind that he might win her back. I think both. Do you? Yeah. Which is amazing after all she's done that he would even consider that. So he had to be very smitten. Well, he's certainly turning the other cheek, isn't he? Absolutely. To an extreme. Tom Use, who was John's next-door neighbor, retired from the Navy that same summer, and he took a job at a steel manufacturing plant a bit of a distance away. This required him to rise early in the morning and often return late in the evening. His wife, Melissa, who had gone to high school with John in the 80s, began to spend a few afternoons each week with John on his porch, sharing iced tea and talking about old times. The glory days. The glory days. (laughs) Soon, though, a few of the neighbors were sure that John and Melissa we're having an affair. Again, we're getting back to small town life. I know. You know. They're bored. They're coming up with stories to entertain themselves. Well, it's good entertainment. Oh, sure. I mean, I've been guilty of it. So. Who's banging who, right? Exactly. It's fun to talk about. In the fall of 2005, the expiration of the latest protection from abuse order, barring John Yelenek from his son, was coming up. So Kevin became agitated at the prospect of renewed visits between John and Jamie. Although Kirkland had tried to convince Kevin that there was absolutely no evidence to prove that John had molested Jamie, Kevin didn't believe her. Well, why would he? And most of his perception probably came from Michelle anyway, so he's going to believe the worst about John. He believes everything Michelle says. There was a hearing on these issues set for November 3, 2005, By then, both John and Kevin were really amped up about it. John's previous experiences with Kevin had convinced him he needed his own bodyguard, since Kevin had previously been backed by his pals in the Pennsylvania State Police. So John asked Tom Use if he would put on his Navy uniform and accompany him to the courtroom. 
This seems a little silly to me, but okay. It does. But as, as I said in the book, Yus was a pretty large guy. So, sure. And in full uniform regalia, he probably could be a little intimidating. Yeah, and it's always better to have someone with you. Yeah. Right? So Yus agreed, he suited up, and he went with John. And at the hearing, the judge not only agreed to return John's guns to him, which had been taken because of the protection from abuse, you can't have a gun. And she also dismissed the April 2005 protection from abuse order. At a recess in the hearing, John was feeling very triumphant over this, and he turned to Kevin in the courthouse corridor. He grinned, he raised up a hand, and extended his forefinger at John. Now, as if to say, gotcha, John said it was a gesture they did on Seinfeld to make, in a nonverbal way, an exclamation of victory. But that wasn't how Kevin saw it. To Kevin, John's gesture was a threat to shoot him. I don't know if he really believed that or if he was just saying that. But when the hearing resumed, testimony was given that John had made a terroristic threat against Kevin. But the judge didn't buy it. The judge quickly ruled that claim out of order and said it was ridiculous. So that led nowhere. But you can see that after that, Kevin's even steaming more. The anger is building. So he filed a formal complaint with the PSP. John Yelenik had threatened to kill a sworn police officer, he claimed. Given that Yelenik had just received his two handguns back, Kevin said, he was in fear of his life. The complaint was eventually dismissed as being unfounded. For the next two weeks, John began meeting Jamie under supervised conditions at a family counseling center in Indiana, and this was in preparation to resume some normal visits. Under the custody agreement, John was entitled to have Jamie for Thanksgiving that year as well. John, Michelle, Jamie, and Kevin arrived at the Indiana police station for the handoff, but by that point, Jamie didn't want to go anywhere near John. He was screaming and in a panic and threw himself into Michelle's arms. So, I can see this dick. He hasn't been allowed to see him for so long. He's a young child. He's probably been poisoned against John. I mean, what do you do in this kind of situation? It's terrible. There's not much you can do. You you can't grab the kid and say you're coming with me. Right. Even even though legally you could. Sure, but if you love the child, you don't want to traumatize them further. No. So So what do you do though? I mean it's a terrible position. Well, he did leave the police station without Jamie. Yeah. And he got more and more resolved to get the divorce behind him and to find a way to reclaim Jamie from Michelle and Kevin. But how do you do that if back at his home he's hearing horrible things? It's a long road, isn't it? I would guess. So as December turned into January, Kevin was becoming increasingly agitated about John. Even before the failed Thanksgiving one-day change of custody, Kevin had told his mother that he prayed John would die. That would solve everything, he said. Dina Kirkland remembered that in January of 2006, Kevin had told her what he told his mother about Yelenek the month before. Kevin, Kirkland told him, you can't say that. Kevin admitted that he knew it was wrong. It was just the frustration of not being able to deny John's legal custody of Jamie. Despite Kirkland's findings, and even Michelle's refusal to take a polygraph test regarding Jamie's claims, Kevin still believed that John was a child molester and Jamie's hysteria about going with John convinced Kevin that everything the boy had said about his father was true. Now, the Indiana police had actually videotaped the incident, which Kirkland used as justification for renewed investigation. It was soon closed after Michelle refused to take the lie detector test. So this Kevin, if if she won't take a lie detector test, although, you know, those aren't always accurate, so I guess you could make excuses why you wouldn't do that. But he seems really just willing to believe whatever she says. Right. And I feel like she's pulling the strings with the child, with John, with Kevin. She's got them all doing her bidding. She does. It's really kind of masterful. If it wasn't so evil, I'd be impressed. (laughs) So, of course, the other side of this Thanksgiving incident was that Jamie might have been reacting as a result of something Kevin or Michelle had told him. Probably was. Some at the Pennsylvania State Police would later become convinced that Michelle and Kevin together were leveraging as much money from John Yelenik as possible to support what they kind of had a lavish lifestyle. Still, Jamie appeared to believe his foster father. 
John Yelenick was a bad man. Kevin's animosity towards John continued to grow to the point of an obsession. Kevin knew that Yelenick was a pervert, he said. He said he could tell just by looking at him. And that was kind of his attitude from a young age, as he could look at someone and tell whether they were good or right. bad. You can, I can tell your character. Which is kind of crazy, and I can almost see a young person thinking that. But with life and experience, you think you would say, okay, you can't judge someone like that, you know? You would. But he didn't seem to mature to that level. No, he didn't. Now, John was convinced that Kevin had some of his police friends keeping him under surveillance. Now, if this really happened, there's no official record of it. Do we really think it happened, I guess? Right. I'm not sure if it was, might have been paranoia. All Kevin wanted was some evidence to put John away. Both men's suspicions stem from what Michelle wanted them to believe. Michelle had manipulated both of them, who were in love with her. Totally. Just, just as you said. Plus the kid. Now, Michelle had not yet signed the final divorce agreement. She seemed to be stalling because John had stopped sending the $2,500 monthly spousal support to Michelle in January 2006 because she had agreed to ending payments at a meeting they had in a coffee shop. But even, even though they had agreed verbally, they hadn't signed it, and Michelle wanted the money due. She wanted John arrested for his failure to pay alimony for January, February, and March. Is that how it works? Do you get arrested for that? You don't get arrested. I wouldn't think so, at least not as the first thing. No, you get told to pay it. Right, I think you'd get some kind of warning. By a judge. Yeah, I would think. But Michelle made a complaint for the failure to pay spousal support, which, if you, can, if you don't go to court, you don't do it, you can end up in jail. That's a potentially a jailable offense. Right, but it's not something where you're just going to get locked up. But anyway, on either Monday, April 3rd, or Tuesday, April 4th, Michelle called the dental office and demanded to speak to John. Georgette Johnson, the office receptionist, later said that when she told Michelle that John wouldn't speak to her unless she signed the final divorce agreement, Michelle became really angry. She needed some of the money John had agreed to pay her on signing, she said, to pay for some expenses of Jamie's. If John didn't send her the money, Michelle said she'd have to apply for food stamps. Now hold the phone with that. What do you think about someone calling and the receptionist? Talking about his personal business with his ex-wife like that. That's kind of weird. It is, but she's looking out for him. I guess, but I wouldn't want to be sharing that information with my employees. No. And this whole idea about food stamps to me is total bullshit. Well, of course it is. Yeah. And why isn't she working if she's concerned about money? Why, indeed. Then she threatened to go to the media, whatever the hell that means. We're going to plaster your picture in the paper. <laughs> right. But John refused to speak to her or give her the money. No signature, no money, he said. Michelle did sign the divorce agreement a day or so before John was murdered, before he could sign it himself. On Wednesday evening, April 12, 2006, Kevin got off his shift at the Indiana barracks and drove to Delmont, and that's halfway between Pittsburgh and Indiana. That's where he played a recreational ice hockey game, and this was practice night. Half of his team was composed of state police officers. A little after midnight, the game was over. So Kevin opened the rear door of his Ford Explorer, where he stored his hockey gear for the trip back to Indiana. And he went on Route 22, which led through Blairsville. He claimed not to have changed out of his uniform after the game. Putting his hockey stick in the back of the Bronco, he would say later, the stick somehow got caught up on one of the seat belts, And as he tried to force it into the truck, it sprang back and hit him in the face, leaving him with two small abrasions above and below his left eye. So that was Kevin's story. Well, that's, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm just not sure how trying to force a hockey stick into a car, it's going to spring back at you. Well, and they tried to reenact that in the court, and they never could. Well, yeah, I don't see it's how It's not they a real could. thing, right? No. But that was his story. That's his story. Mm-hmm. But sometime early that morning, maybe an hour or so later, Someone with a very sharp knife went through the unlocked back door of John Yelenick's house in Blairsville and cut him to pieces. Right. But it wasn't him, Kevin insisted. By the time John Yelenick died, he was home in Indiana with Michelle, Nicole, Nathan, Jamie, and they had a newly adopted baby from Guatemala. He said they would all testify to the fact that he was home. Which makes no sense, because the kids all had to be asleep, right? Right. Maybe they were all waiting up for him. Yeah, even the baby. Even the baby. John Yelenick's neighbors would try to figure out what took place that night in Blairsville. 
Some thought they heard two men shouting in the early morning hours between one and two. Several thought they'd heard screaming that was blood-curdling, as if an animal were being slaughtered. And they said neighborhood dogs were barking. But one neighbor thought the argument had taken place much later, around 3 or 3.30 a.m., or even later than that. So there had been two arguments, maybe? Or two different confrontations? Or even two different intruders, but only one killer? Or more likely in my mind, you had an eyewitness that really, or an ear witness, that didn't have his time straight. But whatever the time of the disturbance, by all accounts, by 4 a.m., the dogs were quiet again and all the neighbors went back to sleep. So sometime the next day, a mail delivery person was at the house and actually dropped off the mail without noticing the big red streaks or the broken glass. Around 3 p.m. that same afternoon, Nine-year-old Zachary Use, who lived with his family next door, came onto the front porch of the house that was owned by Dr. John Yelenek. Now, he wanted to return a video game that the dentist had loaned him a day or two earlier. Zachary saw that a small window pane on the left side of the door had been knocked out, something that the mail person didn't notice for some reason. There was broken glass on the porch, and there were red streaks coming down the shattered frame and a puddle of red. He looked into the broken window and saw the legs of a man lying on the floor in the entry hall, but the torso was out of his view into the living room. So Zachary ran back to his house and told his older brother, Craig, who was 17, that something was terribly wrong at Dr. Yelenek's house. After that, the two boys went over, and Craig saw the broken glass and the red streaks. He looked through the shattered glass pane and saw the legs in the hallway. Then he called out to Dr. Yelenek and he tried the front door, but it was bolted from the inside. So he reached in through the broken window frame, slid back the deadbolt, and went in. Once he got inside the house, Craig saw blood all over the entry hall on the floor and all the way up the walls. He saw the curtains crumpled with their rod and splattered with a dark substance that looked like blood. Dr. Yelenek was lying face up, surrounded by blood, big pool of blood. Craig looked to see if the dentist was breathing, but his chest wasn't moving. So he backed out of the house, ran next door, called his grandfather, who lived a few streets away. Then Craig returned to the front porch, where he was soon joined by his grandfather. The grandfather also went inside the house to make sure that John Yelenek was definitely dead. Then he called 911. Seems like they should have called 911 sooner than that, but... I would have. Yeah. But I guess they wanted to make sure they weren't calling for nothing. So Blairsville patrol officer Donald Isherwood got the call just before 3.30 that afternoon. The dispatcher told him there was a medical emergency, a possible heart attack. Now, where this information came from, despite the bloody evidence to the contrary, we don't know. Isherwood drove to the address, and he saw a crowd of people on the porch. Then inside, lying face up on the living room floor, was John Yelenek's horribly slashed body, covered with drying, tacky blood. And there was a shoe print in the blood, on the hardwood floor leading out of the living room into the hallway. Yelenek was barefoot. The living room was a mess with papers and photographs lying all around on the floor. Officer Isherwood saw it look like a blood smear on the handle of the back door. It seemed obvious that someone had slashed John numerous times with a very sharp knife, leaving him to bleed to death on his floor, and then exited by the back door, leaving the smear of blood on the knob. This was the only other way out of the house because the front door had been bolted, from within. It also appeared that whoever the killer was had rammed John's head through the narrow window next to the front door. Pretty gruesome scene. Oh, very gruesome. From the beginning, investigators wanted to know about the relationship between the dead dentist and the use boys. If there wasn't one, why had Melissa Use just given Yelenek a check for $14,000? Yeah, they found that check on the floor. Right, it was among the papers on the crime scene, along with photographs of his son, Jamie. Also, it was weird that the TV was on and it was tuned to Nickelodeon, the kids' channel. I'm not sure what to make of that, other than maybe he liked to watch kids' shows. There were two boys, both admittedly having friendly relationships with this single man, someone already twice accused and exonerated, of homosexual child abuse by his former wife. Also, one of the boys had admitted being inside the house of the deceased before authorities arrived. One of their parents had also given the check to the deceased for $14,000, so these circumstances seem suspicious. Was the death of John Yelenek a case of blackmail gone wrong? The county detectives questioned the Use family 
for hours that night of April 13th, but there were no breakthroughs. The pursuit of the Use family made those suspicious of the authorities, like John's cousin, Mary Ann Clark, even more suspicious, as if those responsible for solving the crime were more interested in looking like they were on the job rather than actually doing something. Kevin Foley had been brought up several times. Michelle was not on good terms with her estranged husband. They hated each other. So why weren't they looking more at them? And Kevin clearly hated John. He liked to flick open his knife, and he'd been known to wish John Yelenick was dead. Kevin had his badge taken away and his gun taken away, and he was assigned to desk duty. There was a lot of circumstantial evidence. The bad feelings between the two men, the pending divorce between John and Michelle, and the unsigned final divorce papers that were scattered on the floor, all covered in John's blood. Michelle behaved strangely at the formal notice of John's death, too. No tears came from her, and she kept looking at Kevin Foley for advice on how to respond to the deputy coroner's questions. Also, Michelle's refusal to have anything to do with making arrangements for John's body after his autopsy seemed strange. I mean, sure, they didn't get along, but wouldn't you still take care of that? It's your husband, soon one, to be ex. One would think, right? Right. But the rest of the evidence was physical. There were tons of photographic documentation of the bloody shoe prints, the blood smears on the rear door handle, and the scrapings of tissue taken from beneath John's fingernails that could contain the killer's DNA. At first, John's murder was not a state police case. The day after the autopsy by Dr. Cyril Wecht, a police officer from Blairsville, John Brandt, drove to the Pennsylvania State Police Forensic Services Unit in Greensburg and took possession of all the physical evidence that was associated with the murder, including the clothes that John had been wearing, as well as the potentially incriminating fingernail scrapings. The fingernail scrapings were taken back to Blairsville, where they were actually put in a small refrigerator that was normally used for DUI blood draws by the Blairsville police. Then they were ignored for months while the Blairsville police tried to conduct an investigation, then didn't have the resources or the expertise to really even do. Eventually, the Blairsville police chief convinced the Pennsylvania Attorney General, Tom Corbett, to insist that the state police do a real investigation with the Federal Bureau of Investigation providing oversight. So even though they let the Hughes family go on the night after the murder, the Pennsylvania State Police were not ready to entirely eliminate them as suspects. The check from Melissa used to John bothered them. They had the uncashed check, and Melissa soon stopped payment on it, having doubts about whose account the funds would end up in. I could see that. I would. Now the detectives, though, thought that the stop payment order might be suspicious. Soon they began to learn gossip from the neighborhood that John and Melissa were lovers. Now yeah, this, but this doesn't fit with the first theory. No, first theory was that he's sexually abusing the kids. And they were, that's why they were, he was giving them money to shut them up or something? But now they're saying something totally different. That he's what, giving her money because they're lovers? Yeah. And see, she's giving it back? I don't get it. It didn't, doesn't fit. No. But it did seem like they wanted to keep the spotlight off Kevin Foley. Yeah, it kind of did. And people who were suspicious of the police thought so. Yeah, and there were several theories put forth. One of these, a former patient of John's who was an admitted drug user, killed John while in search of controlled substances. And another, a well-known jailhouse snitch in Pittsburgh, claimed that gangbangers from the big city had cut the dentist's throat during a home invasion robbery gone wrong. Yeah, but this was much more than a throat cutting. Yeah, but the local detectives still favored Big Tom Use as the most likely culprit. And that was strange. We got different things here, you know. Maybe Yus had killed John in a jealous rage because he was having an affair with his wife, or John was blackmailing the Yuses, or the Yuses were blackmailing John. A lot of rumors and innuendo flying around. It does make you wonder why they're going for all this stuff but not looking at Kevin Foley. Although at least he did get suspended. Beyond all this conjecture was the reality that the most likely suspect was Kevin Foley. The state trooper, the guy who wished John Yelenick was dead, whose mistress, Michelle, really stood to get all of John's money when he died. Kevin was also well known for wearing running shoes like those that left the bloody shoe prints. The shoe prints were Asics sneakers size 10 to 11. Kevin wore a 10 and a half and he wore Asics when he was running. Also, he had abrasions around his eye the day after the murder. The ones he claimed came from the hockey stick. The rebound hockey stick. <laughs> 
right? Uh, yeah. After John Yelenik was murdered, Kevin put his pocket knife away and never flicked it again. That's strange. That's according to his fellow state troopers. Trooper Charles Gonglick was an experienced investigator, and he'd been processing crime scenes for years. He looked at his own photographs of the bloody shoe prints, and he felt sure that if he ever got the suspect's shoes, he could match the soles to the images. The killer had been sloppy, he thought, in a panic, or possibly arrogant, to leave those prints behind. Maybe all three. Now, to him, a shoe print was almost the same as a fingerprint because of the wear patterns on the sole of a shoe. Because no one walks exactly the same way, the wear pattern on a shoe was distinctive, and a shoe print was unique. But within a few days, the Blairsville Police Department had taken all the evidence, including all 11 rolls of his shoe print photographs. Blairsville Police Officer Brand obtained the evidence from Gonglick in Greensburg on April 15, 2006. He turned John's clothing and blood samples over to the PSP Crime Lab, which was across the street from Greensburg Barracks, where Gonglick's crime scene unit was based. The crucial fingernail clippings from the autopsy, however, those went back to Blairsville. That wasn't the end of Gonlick's involvement in the murder case. He returned to the crime scene a few days later, and he had luminol with him. And this was in an effort to develop more shoe prints. He sprayed the floors and walls with a chemical, which reacts to the presence of human blood, and soon took more photographs, which revealed still more faint shoe prints that were also traced in blood. Gonglick claimed he could identify nearly a dozen shoe prints as they exited the rear door after the murder was committed. He was sure that if someone had brought him a suspect's shoe, he could identify the killer. Meanwhile, John's cousin, Marianne Clark, had gone to court. She asked a judge to appoint her the personal representative of her dead cousin's estate, and she sought to be named the guardian of Jamie. By then, Marianne was convinced that Kevin Foley had murdered John. She wanted to make sure not only that Kevin answered for this crime, but that Michelle never got any of John's money. So let's talk a bit about the Use family and Tom Use as suspects or a person of interest. Yeah, well, the, the local police and, and the state police investigators, they were all focused on the neighbors, Tom and Melissa Use. They were classified as persons of interest from early on. Now, throughout 2006, the Uses were interviewed time and time again. And they were even interviewed separately to see if one of them would slip up under questioning and give away enough motive to justify arresting one of them. Their lives were totally changed by all these rumors. They still had to go to work every day, keep up with Craig and Zach's school activities, and take care of Melissa's sick mother. So they were certainly under strain day after day while trying to understand how their high school friend could have been murdered. They knew all about the trouble Michelle had put him through over the years. Numerous divorce issues over property, money, and most importantly, visitation arrangements concerning Jamie. Now, Kevin Foley seemed like the obvious suspect, but how could they prove it? Well, Melissa and Tom used to have weekly barbecues where they would invite John, their families and friends, and all the kids on the block. Melissa enjoyed cooking and baking for the group, which brought back their shared memories of growing up in the small town. Breads, pastries, and cakes were her specialties. So for years, Melissa's friends encouraged her to open a bakery. By February of 2006, she and Tom decided to apply for a small business loan. And as the weeks passed, they were told that more funding would be necessary for the down payment. Even with the loan and financial assistance from Melissa's family, they still needed another $15,000. And John offered them a personal loan in the amount they needed to finalize their contract. He supported Tom and Melissa's bakery idea, and their friendship, it had lasted over 20 years, so to John, they're like family. While John was negotiating his divorce agreement, though, Michelle had received additional income of about $100,000 during 2005, and she decided to file her own taxes, declaring she was single, and claim the kids. So the divorce hadn't been filed yet, and having claimed all four as deductions in the past years, John realized that this really created a financial problem for him. Of course, he needed to pay additional taxes. So he asked Tom and Melissa to return the $15,000 loan, but promised them that he would replace the full amount by the end of April. So on April 7, 2006, a $14,000 check was made payable to John Yelenik 
and Melissa gave it to him, telling him she'd have to come up with the other thousand in a week or two. She had already spent some of it. But law enforcement agencies really focused on that check. According to them, this was the motive to build a case against Tom Use. The check kept them under suspicion for over a year. Feeling like the walls were closing in, Melissa accepted an invitation from her mother and a group of her friends, and she went to a luncheon at a bed and breakfast in Indiana. Sister psychics Susan Kelly and Jean Vincent provided readings there. As Melissa's mother was being read, John Yellenick's spirit was felt by Suzanne, Suzanne said. Surprised at all the details surrounding the circumstances of John's murder that Suzanne offered during the reading, Melissa believed it and asked Suzanne and Jean if they would go to John's home where the crime took place to see if they could get any more insights. And this was basically because she wanted to get the suspicion off of her and her family. And they agreed. So this is what we played in the beginning of the episode was the psychics, which I thought was ridiculous. For one thing, they had read about the case. Come on. Most of these things came from the newspapers, the mentioning of policemen, all that kind of stuff. So they went to the house and she wanted to see if John's family would consent. They did. So cousin Mary Ann went there at the same time. On July 8th, that was the first time the two psychics came to the house with Melissa and more information was channeled through Suzanne and Jean telling of the details that were leading up to the murder, such as how John was murdered, why he was murdered, who was present, what was left behind, and so forth. These psychics disclosed other possibilities to the police. They even offered the possibility that one of their own might have committed the crime. And of course they said that because they'd heard about Kevin. They claimed that they could feel John fighting for his life and the blood around their feet. According to the psychic sisters, the intruder came in from the kitchen door and the treehouse is where he sat waiting and watching John before the murder. So if you're interested, and it's really pretty much a waste of time, but if you're interested, there's a 20-minute video about these Psychic Sisters on YouTube, and you can find it by searching Psychic Sisters Solved Murder of Blairsdale Dentist John Yelenick. And solved murder, really? Well, I don't think they did anything other than what was easily obtained from the papers, right? It totally seems like it. What yeah. did they say that wasn't already known? Got me. And do you think they did it for free? I'm sure they didn't, but who knows? Who knows? Anyway, to me, the psychics didn't reveal anything, but of course, everyone can judge for themselves. And then finally, seemingly out of the blue, on September 27, 2007, Kevin was called into the office by his supervisor, where he was handcuffed and read his Miranda rights. He was escorted out to a state police vehicle, transferred to the Indiana County Jail, fingerprinted, photographed, and put in a cell. Now, he had to wait for his preliminary hearing to take place, which would be within six weeks. Attorney General Tom Corbett held a press conference attended by all law enforcement agencies in the area of Indiana County and the local news media to announce the arrest of Trooper Foley for the murder of Dr. John Yelenick. And this seemingly came out of the blue. Yeah, and that's pretty right. rare for a state trooper to be arrested for murder, right? That's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah. So they had an eight-hour hearing, and then during this hearing, it was found that there was enough evidence for the state of Pennsylvania to hold Trooper Foley for the homicide of Dr. Yelenick. The date for Commonwealth vs. Kevin James Foley was scheduled for July 15, 2008, and bail was not offered due to the classification of the case as a homicide. So Foley remained in the Indiana jail until his trial. And this was just a few blocks away from where Michelle and the children lived. Well, by the beginning of February 2008, Kevin Foley wanted out of jail and the bail issue came up again. His attorney requested a bail hearing. His mother, Gail, brother James, and his aunt showed up in court, but only to hear Judge Martin deny bail. Michelle was seen visiting him from time to time, bringing their adopted son to see him. In the spring of 2008, the defense requested a continuance, admitting they needed more time to gather investigative evidence. Foley's hearing was moved to November 9, 2008. After more defense motions to postpone, the trial didn't actually begin until March 9th of 2009, and it lasted until March 18th. So let's talk a little bit about that. 
Well, the prosecutor's opening statements focused on five points to explain why Kevin was accountable for the murder of Dr. John Yelenek. First of all, the DNA under Dr. Yelenek's fingers matched Kevin Foley. Second, his outbursts of anger towards the victim. Third, video film footage placed Foley's SUV passing two sheet stores located along the drive from the Delmont ice hockey rink, where he had been at practice the night of the murder, into the morning of the 13th of April through Blairsville, en route to Susan Drive in Indiana. Fourth, the knife that was the weapon of choice was used by the assailant, although they didn't have the actual weapon, did they? No, but just that it was a knife and that he was always playing with a knife, I think. And fifth, the bloody shoe print made by an A6 gel Creed shoe, which was worn by Foley for years. That brand and model. And model. Now, he ended with stating to the jury that Kevin Foley had the motive, opportunity, and the ability to do the crime. Well, Foley's defense attorney really liked the phrase jumping to conclusion by the prosecution. He used that many times. He said that Kevin Foley was innocent. Why? Because there was no trace of John Yelenick's blood found in Kevin Foley's SUV. The sheet's video used to verify his SUV racing through the streets of Blairsville was inconclusive due to the poor quality of the film. As far as the DNA found and tested, he said that that was unreliable. And to me, of course, that's the most damning evidence there is. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll talk about that some more. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, Kevin Hmm. Foley was targeted by his supervisor because they didn't get along, they said. He also pointed out to the jury that there were at least three other persons of interest that the prosecution should have investigated but failed to. And these individuals, they said, had financial ties to Dr. Yelenik. Early on the morning of Thursday, around 2 a.m., according to the defense, a neighbor across the street from Yelenik's house heard a man's voice yelling out, I will never loan you any money again. And he left the jury again with these three words, jumping to conclusions. So, let's go over some of these witnesses. Okay. So the, the first one we'll talk about is Dr. Cyril Wecht who was the forensic pathologist who uh, studied the body. World famous, renowned, well-known. He was well-known. Yes. So he gave a description of how the victim was murdered in a carving fashion by a knife. And he also described how fragments of glass were found embedded in the skin of Yelenik's neck when his head went through a side window panel. He also explained numerous defensive wounds found on the victim's right hand, wrist, and forearm. He had apparently put up a fight to live. These were so deep. Disgusting. Uh, Once his jugular was cut, when he went through the window, he only had a few minutes to live. Dr. Weck stated that the cause of death was exsanguination, which means basically that Mm -hmm. he bled out. Right, bled to death. Right. Then we have Charles Conrad, who is an Indiana County deputy coroner. He assisted Blairsville police officer Jill Gaston when they reported the death of Dr. Yelenek to his estranged wife, Michelle, the night of April 13th. Yeah, at her house. At her house. And then Jill Gaston, at the home of Michelle, on that same night, noticed a fresh red scratch mark above the left eye of Kevin Foley. Now, Gaston insisted her observation was correct under oath several times. Trooper Worcester saw it also at the Indiana barracks the morning of April 13th when he and Kevin Foley reported to work for an eight-hour shift together. Mm-hmm. Harold German Jr. is the neighbor who heard what he described as pig sounds on or about one in the morning, April 13th. Well, then you have James Ferguson, a neighbor who heard loud, loud sounds around one uh, twelve to one fifteen a.m. that morning. Maria Alexander, a neighbor who heard a male screaming on or about 1.30 a.m., Vincent Ugoletti, a neighbor who heard two male voices talking about 1.15 to 1.30 a.m., Robert Worcester, who you mentioned, was an Indiana State Police Trooper in the crime unit who noticed the red scratch on Trooper Kevin Foley's face when he reported for duty that morning of the 13th. They had both played hockey at practice the evening before, and according to Worcester, he was told an excuse by another trooper in the unit. Foley told him that he received a scratch from a flying hockey puck. Worcester disagreed with that officer, stating that Foley wears a metal face guard when he plays in the non-checking league during practice. So, uh aha. Well, yeah, except for the fact that apparently he's given two different stories about how he got the injury. Well, yeah, you've got the two different stories, plus you've got the protective face mask. 
So he lied and said he got the scratch, but he couldn't have because he was wearing it, right? I mean, that's the way I took it. Do you not take it that way? The way I take it is the one guy's telling him that Foley told him he got hit with a puck, but Worcester's saying, well, he told me that he got hit with a stick and it couldn't have been the puck anyway because he always wears the face guard. I get it. Yeah. It's kind of the way I see it. Okay. But there's still two different stories about how he got it. Absolutely. Okay. And neither of them make any sense because you have the stick thing that wouldn't work and you've got the puck thing where he was wearing the mask. So neither story is believable. Either way. Yeah. We have Dina Kirkland, who's the Indiana State Police trooper and partner of Kevin Foley, who had investigated the abuse allegations against Dr. Yelenik. She testified to Foley's dislike towards Yelenik. She told the jury of Foley's comments while they were transferring a prisoner one day, when out of the blue, Foley told her he hoped John Yelenik would be killed in a car crash. Mm -hmm. Then in 2005, Foley asked her to investigate charges brought up by Michelle Yelenik in reference to John touching their son Jamie during a visitation weekend. Now Robert Elsevage, a Greenberg State policeman assigned to the crime lab, also testified he's a fabric expert analyst who examined the cut marks found on the gray sweatshirt the victim was wearing at the time of his murder. And he determined what type of instrument made the cuts, which would match up to the kind of knives that Foley was known for playing around with. We also had Geraldine Conway, an FBI agent at Quantico, and she was an analyst of DNA matching. She noted a 90% match to Dr. Yelenik and a 10% match to Foley. Dr. Robert Cotton, professor at Boston University School of Medicine, stated she found there was a 1 in 23 million chance that the DNA sample studied from Dr. Yelenik matched someone other than Kevin Foley. And then Dr. Mark Perlin, who is CEO of Cybergenetics in Pittsburgh, outdid her, claiming even a higher probability of 1 in 189 billion. Yeah, which is now, exclusionary. To, to me, it doesn't matter. I mean, whether it's 23 million or 13,000 or 189 billion, it's still likely Foley's DNA. Well, I mean, it depends on how many people. If it's 1 in 100... That wouldn't okay. be good enough. But even the, the most conservative one was one in... 23 million. Well, how many people lived in the town? Right. I don't know. I think the higher numbers, though, the more people are impressed with it. So well, it's sure. important to get it as high as you can. That's what they wanted. Exactly. Terry Shalo of ASIC's American Corporation is a product manager for performance running shoes, and he provided information on shoe treads, in particular the Gel Creed Plus style that Foley wore. The treads of the Gel Creed Plus sole match the shoe prints found at the crime scene throughout the first floor of the house. He also produced the order form used by Foley with his credit card number, address, and home job phone numbers. That's pretty good, and all these exhibits were displayed for the jury as well. I remember reading the book that Foley said he often ordered shoes for co-workers. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, that's weird. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Robert Hare... Greensburg State Police Trooper with the Criminal Investigation Unit, worked with the video surveillance tapes from the Sheets stores. He narrated from the film the highlights of a, an SUV that resembled Foley's on April 13, 2006, traveling from the Delmont Ice Rink towards Blairsville at 12.18 a.m. onto East Market Street, where the Blairsville Sheets is located. The time and speed were calculated to determine the travel range. Amanda Broyles, FBI agent in the Operational Technology Division for the Forensics Video, Audio, and Image Analysis Unit, also testified, and she compared vehicles on digital video film of Foley's SUV passing the new Alexandra Sheets and the Blairsville Sheets with a photo of his SUV. Her conclusion was due to the high compression of the film. Her conclusion was that due to the high compression of the film, it was very difficult to compare it with the surveillance footage. So she wouldn't include or exclude the known vehicle as being the vehicle in the two videos. So a defense witness, Isaiah Brader, who lived across the street in an apartment building facing the Yelenik house, said he heard two voices coming from across the street and one was louder than the other. The louder voice stated that he would never loan money to them. He heard glass shattering. At one point, he thought it was a garbage truck throwing out glass. Yeah, this guy's the defense witness because he's the outlier. He's testifying that he heard the commotion 
couple hours later than everyone else testified. Yeah, and talking about loaning money, which would point the finger at the use family. Right. right. Then there's William Bagley, who is also a defense witness. He was a prisoner in the Westmoreland County Jail, and he stated that he heard another prisoner claim responsibility for the doctor's death. Yeah, he was pretty much torn apart in cross-examination, though, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. And then the last day, March 18th, Kevin Foley took the stand in his own defense. So he was questioned about asking Trooper Dina Kirkland to investigate the molestation claim Michelle had filed against John. He discussed Foley's ten and a half size shoe and his ordering of gel creed on his credit card, the number of knives he owned, where he stored them, his habit of playing with his knife at work, where he flicked it open and closed, also asked about the fresh scratch above his eye. Foley said in response to these questions he was just joking with troopers about wishing Yelenik would die. His threats against Yelenik, he claimed, he had no intention to carry them out. No blood was found on the shoes taken from his home. No fingerprints from Foley were found at the scene. Well, that's easy. You wear gloves. Right. Now, he stated he did not hate John Yelenik, nor did he show any violence toward him. On redirect by his defense attorney to take some of the sting out of the evidence that the sexual abuse allegations were determined to be false, Kevin was asked if Kirkland had told him she still believed the allegations were true, but it was determined to be hearsay. Kevin couldn't testify about what Kirkland had told him out of court. Well, yeah. And after a few more questions, the defense rested his case without calling Michelle Yelenik as Kevin's alibi witness. The jury had only Kevin's word that he'd been at home with Michelle, Nathan, and Nicole on the night of the murder. To me, that's pretty interesting to lose what could have been a star witness, an exonerating witness, saying, Kevin was home with me. But that would open her up to cross-examination, and that's why I think that happened. Well, yeah. That would be a big mess. It would be. I yeah. can see that. But right. I, I would have loved to hear the discussions about whether or not she was going to get called. But, I mean, even at that stage where his life's on the line and he might go to prison, I could see him defending her and trying to keep her safe from it. Because that's what he was all about. When we went back to his childhood and everything, that was his thing. Yeah. It probably made him feel good to go to prison for her, believe he's, it or not. He's the white knight. That's exactly it, yeah. Well, the jury stayed into the evening after final remarks and deliberated. At 10 p.m., the jury sent a note to the judge, and they had reached a verdict. So they filed into the courtroom, and a paper was handed to the judge, who read it to himself, then handed it to the court clerk, who announced that he was found guilty. The day after the verdict was announced, according to Mary Ann Clark, John's cousin, Michelle Yelenik packed up her children and left the city of Indiana. Michelle had not attended one day of Kevin's trial. She moved to Savannah, Georgia, where I think she still lives. She ended up living with that wealthy man in her life, the heir that she had been with before. She ended up with Kevin, I believe. So she lives there in Savannah with the kids and this new guy. Now, her daughter Nicole enrolled in college at Pittsburgh and her son Nathan in college in Indiana. In June of 2009, Kevin was sentenced to life in prison. He would live the remainder of his life in the 9 by 11 cell in a solitary section of a state correction facility. And they did this because he was a state trooper and he would certainly be a popular target. Sure, yeah, I would imagine. Now he has appealed the verdict. Foley asked the state's highest appellate court to dismiss his conviction based on ineffective counsel. Among Foley's claims in the appeal was that his attorneys failed to pursue a defense at trial that a neighbor of Yelenik may have committed the murder. I think they tried to do that, but they just there was nothing there. There wasn't. No. The court rejected the appeal in 2014, and state superior court unanimously denied it that October. So Foley's serving his life sentence at SCI Retreat in Luzerne County. I think it's funny that they call it a retreat. Yeah, probably far from that. Yeah. But why would this Kevin sacrifice a 14-year career in law enforcement, which, you know, he'd worked hard for, and this relationship with the new baby they adopted, to kill somebody? I mean, was the hatred so great, or do you think Michelle was just really egging him on? Well, it was a particularly gruesome murder. Sure it was. was. A, lot of, a lot of rage. Yeah. So I, I think that he really hated Yelenik. But why? Well, he was a child abuser. Yeah. So you think she just kept feeding that to him? Well, I think he believed it, whether yeah. she kept feeding it or, or it was just his firm belief. 
Right. He did have that blanket belief that he could judge people like that. Right. Remember? Black and white. Yeah. Well, it's just strange because I think probably with his protective instincts, he may have been able to be a good father if he'd gone the other way. Could have. Yeah. Yeah. Now, once Michelle had signed that divorce agreement, there was really nothing more for her to get. You know, she couldn't get money or property or even the life insurance. But I'm wondering, I mean, wouldn't Jamie have gotten some of John's estate and then she'd have control over that? Everything went to Jamie and he would inherit it when he turned 18. So she couldn't spend any of it before then on him? Seems like there are loopholes for that. Well, maybe, but not a significant amount of money. Okay. And she would still have some say to Jamie about what he should do with the money. When he's 18? When he's 18. Probably, but he could say, screw you and take it. He could. But as far as we know, she's living in Georgia with him Mm -hmm. and her other adopted child. So they're still together. Well, I mean, he's not an adult yet, is he? He was born in 98. He'd be 20 years old now. Okay. So anyway, she'd be super controlling, I would guess, even when they're yeah. he's a young adult. She'd probably she, control she, all she that. She would be. Yeah. All right. Well, do you think something happened between John and Michelle on the 12th? Something that enraged Kevin even more than anything and set him off? No, do you, I don't think so. Do you think he went over there to confront John about something and John stood up to him? Maybe. Or do you think he went there with the plan to murder? I think if he had a knife with him, of course, he always carried a knife with him, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. So maybe that's not the right way to look at it. But I, my, my thought is that he went over there with the intention of killing him. It doesn't look like he knocked on the front door and asked to be let in. He went in the back door and then snuck and left by the oh, back that's door. That's a good point, yeah. So he didn't go in there for any legitimate reason. So, Plus it was midnight. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you feel about Michelle not being held responsible? I guess there's no evidence against her, but... I guess not. I think there's some responsibility there. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been articles and books that all suggest Michelle was manipulating both men to get what she wanted. Yeah. So some suggested books on this case. We'd like to thank Carlton Smith for his book, Dying for Love, and Andrea Neapas for her book, Death Needs Answers. And I would recommend both. I mean, they're very different, very thorough But the Death Needs Answers one is more in-depth about the trial. And Dying for Love is more about what led up to the murder. But I would recommend both if you're interested in this case. So before listener feedback, a big thank you to our listeners, our Tie Grabber members, our Patreon supporters, and everyone who takes the time to write to us. If you have feedback or a crime you'd like to suggest, why not leave us a voicemail? You can click on Leave Us a Voicemail on our website, tiegrabber.com, or you can even record your feedback on your phone and email it to us at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. I think all smartphones have the little voice recording feature. Why listen to us read your feedback when we can hear it straight from you? If listening to True Crime Brewery is a positive little part of your life and you'd enjoy an extra episode to listen to once in a while, you can offer your support by joining Team Tie Grabber at tiegrabber.com or by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash true crime brewery. As a member, you'll get access to about 20 members only episodes that are already out there, plus all the new ones that we release every month. When you join, we'll send you a bottle opener or a sifter. I also throw in a few other pieces of swag, goodies like stickers and magnets and coasters. And after you sign up, if you don't see your email right away, i just like to remind you to check your junk mail, because sometimes that's where it ends up. Some other ways to offer some support are to follow us on Twitter at TieGrabberPods, on Instagram, or on Facebook. You can also participate in our Facebook True Crime Brewery fan discussion page. Also, if you have a few extra minutes, if you'd be nice enough to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast, that really helps out a lot. It doesn't have to be a five-star. As long as it's honest and it's what you think, we're happy to get your review. So let's do some feedback. I'm very happy to announce that our first one is a voicemail. Yay, voicemail. Okay, I'm going to play a voicemail from Bonnie Parkin. Hi, guys. My name's Bonnie, and I love um, your podcast. I listen to it both on um, Apple and um, on YouTube, just depending on if I'm at home or in the car. But I do have a case suggestion it is, um, if you watch on Amazon Prime, it's called Goodnight Sugar Babe. 
the killing of Vera Jo Regal. And um, it's about, let me see, one cold spring morning, a naked female body is discovered on a train bridge in the center of Finley, Ohio, and sends a shockwave through the quiet all-American town. Although the victim is bruised and mutilated, a police officer recognizes her and goes to check on the welfare of Vera Jo Regal, a mentally challenged young mother with a history of being abused by her baby daddy, Zachary Brooks. Despite having a social worker monitoring the case and repeated calls to 911 warning she was in danger, the officer's fears are confirmed. Vera was missing and soon identified as the body on the tracks. And the interesting thing about this is that the person who actually, um, or the people who actually did the killing, um, and the lady who, um, had, it, it's just insane, absolutely insane. And you probably will need to take a shower after <laughs> watching this video, but <laughs> it's, um, it's so sad and, um, horrible. So she got cut off there. I guess all of a sudden <laughs> she was there and then she wasn't. Right. Yeah. That, that sounds like an interesting case. It does, doesn't it? So I'm definitely going to look into that. Yeah, we have to. Although it does sound really bad, but most of them are, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, we just got through basically a mutilation of a body or a person that resulted in bleeding out. Well, and did you hear the um, psychic say that it was basically a bludgeoning? Do they not know what bludgeoning means? No. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm just checking. <laughs> Just checking why they said that. It seemed like a weird thing. Because if anything, it was certainly not a bludgeoning. No, not at all. Slicing and dicing. All right. Why don't you read our first email? Okay. Back to emails. More voicemails, please. Yes. I have a case suggestion from Wendy R. Hi, Jill and Dick. Thanks for providing me with entertainment as I commute to and from work, and even sometimes at work when it is boring. I would like to recommend the case of Jordan Brown, it's a super disturbing case because this boy was only 11 years old when he committed what seems to be completely cold-blooded murder. 11. 11. Wow. So the story is on February 20th, 2009, 11-year-old Jordan Brown murdered his father's 26-year-old fiance, Kenzie Hook, who was eight months pregnant at the time. While the soon-to-be mother was sleeping in her bed in their New Beaver, Pennsylvania farmhouse, Jordan shot her in the back of the head using a gun given to him by his father. Now, Houck's youngest daughter alerted nearby adults to the situation after Jordan had gotten onto the school bus. He initially was to be tried as an adult, but was eventually found guilty of first-degree murder as a juvenile. Wow. So I don't think we've ever covered any cases. I think the youngest murder we covered was probably the runaway devil. She was 13 or 14. 13 or so. But yeah. she had a boyfriend who did most of the physical killing. Right. So. Well, I, I think this is something to, to look into. I would be interested in seeing. Wendy says it was a gun given to Jordan by his father. Yeah. Were, well. there, were there instructions on what to do with it? Yeah, kill my fiancé. Well, I'm just wondering. I don't know. I, I would think if that was the case, that would have been found out. But let's read more about it and find out. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. So Sarah has case suggestion about honor killings of Sarah and Amina Sayed. Hey there, I love your show and I listen every Tuesday. It's my favorite. Thanks, Sarah. Recently, I watched this documentary and it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's about two young girls, Amina and Sarah Sayed, killed by their own father. The murderer father is still evading justice and is on the FBI's top 10 most wanted. The mother, I believe, was brainwashed. The father married her at, I believe, 14 or 15. And many believe she tricked her daughters into coming home, knowing that their father would murder them. Someone close to the family had reported that the mother said she knew Yasser wouldn't allow the daughters to live after running away. Apparently, the father also sexually abused his daughters, and there is video footage he filmed that is very suggestive and disturbing. The story was shocking, and the real tragedy is this honor killing is a thing in some cultures. After I watched and read about this case, I discovered there have been many more. Horrific acts committed against young women simply for the crime of wanting to live their own lives. Here are a few more, one of which includes another father killing his own daughter by running her over with the car. So at this point, she put in a couple of links for us to look at. Anyways, I thought you guys might be interested as it's not just an isolated incident, and it seems that killings of children at the hands of their own parents seem to be quite rare. Thanks again for your show. Well, I don't think we've covered any honor killings. No, we haven't. So that might be something to look into. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, I think we will. I hope we don't offend too many people of certain religions. Well, if it's people who believe in honor killings, I don't mind offending them. Okay. So thank you, Sarah. Then Belinda, also with a case suggestion. She says, here is an older case I would love you two to cover. When you do the older cases, I feel like I'm learning some history with my true crime fix. I agree. I like a little history in my true crime. Not every time, but I enjoy it from time to time. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Now, this case is over 100 years old. Wow. Oh, that might be fun. In June 1914, Frederick Moores left his native Austria and immigrated to New York City, where he soon found himself as a porter in a nursing home called the German Odd Fellows Home. It wasn't long before he was promoted to nursing assistant, but suspicious things started happening. Even though it wasn't unusual for nursing homes to lose their elderly patients, far more died than normal. Seventeen German odd residents died within four months. Now, it was soon revealed that Morris was personally responsible for at least eight of those deaths. He used arsenic, opium, and morphine to poison his victims, but then he decided to invent a new method of poisoning that wouldn't leave any evidence. He anesthetized the patients before pouring chloroform into their mouths. Now, they did find burn marks around the mouth of one of his victims, so he refined his method and then started greasing his victims' faces with Vaseline. He might have been getting away with his murders indefinitely, but he decided to confess his crimes to an assistant district attorney in February 1915. Now, according to his confession, his victims had needed to be put out of their misery. Moores was committed to Matawan State Prison for the Criminally Insane, but somehow, sometime during the 1920s, he escaped. He was never caught, and his ultimate fate remains a mystery. Ooh, now, a mystery. Those two things would be pretty cool. Yeah. The fact that it's over 100 years old, and that this guy escaped and managed to keep himself out of trouble. Or, yeah, because or, he'd have to be dead by now. He certainly would. Yep, interesting. I like it. Thanks, Belinda. Nick B. has a case suggestion. Hi, Dick and Jill. You're the best true crime podcasters. Well, Nick, you're the best listener ever. I don't know what this says about me, Nick says, but this case has always fascinated me. Here's a summary for you. Alex and Derek King were a pair of pimply, scruffy Florida boys on the cusp of adolescence. Their troubled youths and broken family had them bouncing around from place to place until they finally both wound up living with their father in 2001. Alex was 12 and Derek 13, when the boys struck up a friendship with an adult named Rick Chavez, a friend of their dad's. Alex and Rick embarked on a homosexual relationship that had 12-year-old Alex declaring in notes found later that before I met Rick, I was straight, but now I'm gay. They just have a little bit of a problem with saying a relationship, because this wasn't a relationship. This was a victimization of this kid, right? True. Yeah, so I just want to say that, but I'll go on. Investigators also found a photo of Alex placed over Chavez's bed. Neither King brother liked their father, so a murder plot was hatched whereby they'd kill him so they could move in with Chavez. When firefighters responded to a call at the King house in November of 2001, they noticed 40-year-old Terry King dead on a couch. His face had been bashed in and his skull split open. Testimonies conflicted over multiple trials, and it was unclear who actually swung the bat that killed Terry King. Both brothers eventually pleaded guilty to third-degree murder and arson. Alex was released from prison in 2008 and Derek in 2009. Chavez will be eligible for parole in 2028. That's a disturbing story. Isn't it? Yeah, that's very twisted. Well, I'd be interested to see. So this was in 2001. They were 12 and 13. So at this point, they're 29, 30, 31 years old. So I'd like to see what's gone on with them since they got released from prison. I'm always interested in stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to see if they turned out okay, if they got any help, or if they're just, their lives are ruined. Right. Because the Chavez is a real sicko. So it seems. It seems like he must have masterminded the whole thing. Yeah, doesn't it? Although I, I really don't want to say masterminded as if it was something great because it was just stupid and shitty. But he must be the one who wanted them to do it and led them into it, I would guess. I mean, he was already molesting one of them. 
So he probably had at least one of them brainwashed, if not both. Right. He did. Yeah, that's terrible. Sick stuff. Mm hmm. Okay, last one. This is a comment on missing Amy Billig from Rebecca. Rebecca says, as a new mom, thinking about what Amy's mother went through after her daughter disappeared truly broke my heart. Sue Billig could have moved away or changed her number, but she chose to stay and answer the abusive calls in the remote hope that she would see her daughter again, or at least find out what happened to her. So the guy who made the calls deserved more punishment. Even though he didn't physically attack the Billigs, he hurt them and made their lives, especially Sue's, so much worse. May he rot in hell if there turns out to be one. Thanks, Jill and Dick. You are my podcast mom and dad. <laughs> First time I've been accused of that. Oh, yeah. I think I've heard that from people before. Oh. Because a lot of our listeners are a lot younger. They're in their 20s, even 30. We're old yeah. enough to be their mom and dad. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Or in oh. some cases, even a grandpa. <laughs> well, anyway. thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. That was a nice comment. And I really, I agree with you. I mean, what that woman went through after she's already lost her daughter, and then this guy keeps calling, and I guess there just wasn't really a law to... Well, that's the problem. I, th I think everybody would have liked him to get a harsher sentence. Absolutely. But they just didn't have anything to charge him with. Yeah, not enough anyway. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for the feedback. As we mentioned before, we would love some more voicemails. Now, you will get cut off after a minute and 30 seconds on our voicemail app if you click on the website to leave a voicemail. That's fine, though. Just call back and add to it. I can paste them together. Or like I said, you can just record it any other way on your computer or on your smartphone and send it as an email attachment. Any way you want to do it, we'd love to get more voicemails, and I'll let it rest at that. This is the end of the podcast, and I hope you'll meet us next time at The Quiet End. We'll be flinging darts. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.